What is up, everyone? Welcome to the Of Like Minds video podcast. I have a super awesome guest today, my good friend Unikin, founder of Keep Company. Una, thank hey. you so much. Thank you so much for coming on today, Una. Of course, my pleasure. Well, anything first, for you, Kev. <laughs> appreciate you. Um, just starting, Una, um, and we're gonna get to we're gonna get to it. But just talking about your your upbringing and and, and your childhood and just kind of growing up and what that was like. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, I'm Korean American, second generation. I was born in Baltimore and uh, born and raised. My parents are academics. Um, and yeah, I grew up in a predominantly white area. And one of the cool things about being uh, here in LA and living in LA is um, really being able to see the difference between like West Coast Asians and East Coast Asians is definitely not like the same experience. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it, uh, you know, anyone who has experience with both of those uh, groups of people can see, you know, knows what I'm talking about. But, um, you know, I, I love being in LA. I also loved growing up in Baltimore. There was a lot of difficulties and challenges with that, but I still uh, really respect my East Coast upbringing and there's a lot to be learned from both coasts and both experiences. So yeah, I, yeah, grew up in Baltimore, surrounded by white people, went to public school. <laughs> oh shoot. <laughs> went, went to public school. My brother went to private school. So kind of had a foot in both worlds. And um, yeah, after high school, I graduated, went to Princeton for undergrad and then uh, worked in New York for a while and then went to Stanford for uh, um, for graduate school so kind of did the whole that's that's ultimately how I ended up on the west coast yeah and then made my way down to LA after after b-school so absolutely well you you talked about your your, your parents being academics so just mm -hmm. being a woman and being Asian and having that strong academic presence in the household what was that like growing up and having to succeed in the classroom uh well I had a lot of pressure on me obviously and you know when the whole tiger mom thing came out I don't know you guys might be too young for that but when the whole tiger mom thing came out I thought that was so funny because I literally was like everybody's mom's not like that really like mm. my 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 upbringing was very disciplined um very very focused on making sure I was maximizing uh all of my talents and trying my parents did everything they could to give me every opportunity to give me the tools to succeed in my life and my parents are, are, were strict and um, focused and goal oriented and ambitious, but at the same time, they're, they're very liberal for the, uh, like, you know, against the Asian stereotype. And they're, they are also really creative thinkers and they're, they're pretty free and pretty, um, uh, I don't know, they're, they really encouraged me to do uh, a lot while, while being very grounded in a sort of prag pragmatism because we're, I'm the child of immigrants. So, yeah. you know, they understand the reality of the world and um, they really wanted to make sure that I was sort of armed with these tools. But at the same time, you know, once I graduated, uh, they really, and I was surprised about this too. They really kind of were like, okay, you can do whatever you want now. Like we've done our part. Mm -hmm. We've shaped you. We've given you what we could. We've given you opportunities and we've tried to level the board, the field for you but um, now you can do whatever you want to do. And it actually was hard for me because I had to retrain myself. I was so used to thinking, oh, that they, they're going to care and they're going to, I had this internalized pressure that it didn't even, um, it was hard for me to, to really like um, trust that they were kind of like, yeah, you can be free now. And, uh, but I really, that kind of attitude is rare, I think, because a lot of immigrant parents especially a lot of parents in general try to live through their children mm. and um and my parents did me the service of, of not doing that so i'm really grateful to them but yeah i grew up in a very very intensely um uh focused household i mean i took the sats every year from third grade on um, third grade? yeah every year oh uh, i never had like a summer where i just except for right before my right before i went to college i never had a summer where i got to just hang out or all the kids were like go to this camp called Camp Putak and like kayak and learn how to build a teepee and stuff. I never got to do that. I was always in some really intense um, like orchestra camp or um, mm. trigonometry camp or critical writing camp or a French camp or whatever, whatever the thing, leadership camp. 
all of those things I did. I also, my parents also made me go to like a lot of seminars like um, Stephen Covey's um, Seven Habits for Highly uh, Successful People or whatever. Like, yeah. like I would be like the only 13 year old person there. Everybody would wow. be like at the Sheraton. We would be in like the conference room and it'd be like all adults, 40s, 30s and like me. <laughs> <laughs> did the Silva method. I did a lot of things. So, but um, at the time, obviously, I was like super annoyed by it and hated it. But um, I do appreciate them because, um, in a weird way, I feel like they really like tuned me as a machine, so that mm. now as an adult, I can really be, really take advantage of like what I learned. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I appreciate them for everything they did for me. My parents are really, really dope people, and I really, um, you know. Everybody thinks, says this, but the older you get, the more you're like, damn, I can't believe like what they did for me. I, could, mm. I, don't, I can't even imagine um, being that selfless and being that invested. But at the same time, the, the number one lesson they showed me was they always had a sense of self. They always had their own interests. They were always very, very active, very successful themselves, had their own um, you know, work and their own uh, things that they, passions that they really cared about and they continue to grow. So my parents weren't the kind of people who once the kids went away, like their life was done. They, they, they're more active than I am now. They have more energy than I have. Now. <laughs> they're, they're more interesting than I am now. Oh you know? my God. So I really, um, you know, the older I, as an adult now, I'm like, wow, I, I really appreciate uh, what good parents are because they they were firm, they were practical, they were pragmatic, but they also taught me how to be free because freedom is a responsibility. And they showed me how to be responsible for my own life. And they also showed me how to balance sort of this creative drive and passion with discipline structure and understanding that, um, you know, life is, is practical. As people who survived a war, they know how quick it is to lose, to lose their livelihood or, you know, they know how quick your life can change. Sorry, my cat's like, no, no worries. Um, so they always uh, were very grounded in reality. And that's something my dad always tried to teach me, which was you have to see things as they are and accept them as they are so that you can take the appropriate steps. If you're constantly sort of in a la-la land or under a, some sort of illusion, you're never going to be able to really um, do what needs to be done. And, uh, you know, that's a fundamental um skill that you need in order to be creative and in order to actually mm -hmm. like do stuff you need to be able to be grounded at the same time often what i see um, as an entrepreneur is and with other small business owners is um you kind of get two ends of this spectrum you either get people really really pra practical really like color in the lines um, have a lot of anxiety and maybe they can't move forward because they've already talked themselves out of it or they're they're so uh, need control that they limit themselves. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have people who are total dreamers, have big ideas, a lot of passion at the beginning, but they don't have follow through. Mm -hmm. And um, both of those, there's nothing wrong with either of those ends of the spectrum. It's just you have, in order to really make things happen, you have to find a, a balancing point. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's kind of what I've seen. Absolutely. I mean, that's, First of all, it's just amazing to know um, everything that your parents had prepped you and, and put you through and seeing how that's come to fruition for you now. And, yeah. and I know that they have a huge influence on you, but you also mentioned about, you know, your brother. Are you the youngest of the siblings? Or yeah, you, um, or? I have an older brother. He's four years older than me. Okay. Three, almost four years older than me. Uh, and yeah, he is, he had a big influence on me for sure. Um, in a weird way, my brother is the one who taught me how to be like American. And my brother is the <laughs> one who taught me because he was first, you yep, know, he yep. was older and he was the leader. I was, I totally looked, looked up to him. I worshiped him when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And he was always a very like alpha, strong, strong person. He always mm -hmm. told us, you know, and this is more of an East Coast thing, I think, because, um, you know, we're so aware of our being a minority. You know, like I'm so yeah. envious. I always was kind of envious when I first moved to LA and like Ashley worked for me or my friend Eddie worked for yeah. me. He grew up in Cerritos and they'd, they'd be like, oh yeah, like 
we don't we didn't grow up with any we don't we didn't grow up with any white people or like mm -hmm. eddie's like oh it was really hard you it was hard to be popular at my school if you're a white person and i was like wait what yeah. like, that was not you know my experience like we really uh kind of was so aware of a pervasive sense of being the other when i grew up and mm -hmm. a lot of it was navigating and negotiating um assimilating to american culture while still retaining our own identity yes. and uh that was a tricky that was a tricky thing to do you know um and yeah so uh but my brother he was always like there's two kinds of Asians. There's the Asians who are going to get teased and are going to take it, not going to say anything. We're going to stay kind of studious and quiet. Mm. And then there's us. And mm. so we learned from a very early age. I learned from a very early age from my brother, like, oh, you have to stand up for yourself and be very assertive. And, um, you know, we kind of like, at least for myself, I was always sort of a, and I regret this now as a more evolved person, but when I was yeah. younger, I was more of like a preemptive bully. Like I wouldn't let anybody mess with me. Mm -hmm. And um, it's nice now to be older and to be able to evolve and to have more softness and more, uh, be more accepting of vulnerability. But when yeah. I grew up there, I was not vulnerable at all. I was a complete yeah. savage. And, <laughs> um, and, I, and I do, I do appreciate that era of my life, but, uh, you know, it's just, it, it's funny to look back and, and see how you grew up and see how it affected you and, and, and also see how you can grow from that and expand from that. So, yeah. so yeah, I grew up, um, definitely feeling really different and definitely feeling on the outside all the time, but constantly sort of playing this game of, uh, making sure that I was still accepted, still had respect. Like that was mm -hmm. the way my brother raised me. Having people's respect was more, was more important than anything. Better than mm. being liked, better than being, you know, more than uh, having approval. It was about being respected. So um, that also meant um, living your life according to a certain code, like standing, standing for something um, and being in the room. In Korean, there's a thing called nunchi and nunchi is kind of because it's in Asian cultures and many Asian cultures, but definitely in Korean culture, you know, there's a lot of personal politics, right? Like mm -hmm. we have uh, different ways of speaking. We have like casual speaking and then we have honorific speaking and you don't speak to your elders casually. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, or just like certain dynamics, interpersonal dynamics, like how you show respect and you don't, um, you're always allowing people to save face or like in a business meeting, you wouldn't. Um, and if you were, you had a boss and you were in a business meeting, you wouldn't necessarily in America be like, Oh, I have this idea. Give me credit for my idea. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but in Asia, a lot of the time it would be like, let, let me show you how to, that. Let me present it so that you had seems like you came up with this idea so that you can take the credit for it. You know, it's, there's a lot of kind of politics like that, which, as a woman, actually, you, I kind of, uh, you encounter a lot because there's a lot more, you have to be much more careful with how you're talking and how you're presenting things. But anyway, uh, yeah, so there's a thing called nunchi. Nunchi is basically like be, re, being able to read the person, being able to um, read the room kind of and, and navigate those dynamics, having mm -hmm. that intuition. And um, in a weird way, I just feel like, because that's part of like, my upbringing, it's runs in my blood, you know, you have mm -hmm. to have nunchi to get through when you're like somebody who's so on the outside and you're, you know, you're reading the room, you're navigating it, you're seeing like, how do I fit in? How do I, how do I communicate to these people and show them like what my value is? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was a really interesting training for me growing up and it was tough and I had a lot of, it was challenging. There was a lot of good things about it and a lot of bad things about it, but regardless, that's part of who I am. So yeah, my brother is definitely the one who, my parents were really like uh, supportive, but strict. And my dad is sort of more like the philosopher and mm -hmm. he's a very spiritual person and kind of has like very sort of Dalai Lama vibes. So he really taught me a mm -hmm. lot of how to think, how to be. Uh, my mom is very passionate and very earthy. She's like a constant like maker, like a bake, she bakes, she cooks, she's, she's a photographer, she does all these amazing things. Um, so she kind of was the person who taught me how to manifest things like, she, I always think of my dad as like 
sky and my mom is earth, you know? Mm. And then my brother is kind of more like fire. He was like the muscle, you know? <laughs> and he showed me how to, and because in America growing up, especially during that time where I grew up, um, you know, as an immigrant, you had to have muscle and you had mm. to be able to uh, stand up for yourself and speak for yourself and, and assert yourself. And especially as a woman too, on top of mm -hmm. all of that. So um, you know, all those things kind of contributed into making me who I am and, uh, however difficult they were, I don't, I don't regret any of them because, you know, is what it is and that's who I am now because of it. So. Absolutely. Um, if you can just kind of going back to one of your first points, just talking a little bit about the differences between the Asians when you were growing up in the East coast in Baltimore and then kind of seeing that culture shock, just like a different way of, I guess, um, interactions and how it is over here in the West Coast, like what that contrast is like? Well, you know, on the East Coast, I grew up again. So there's, I mean, this thing that we learned in Asian American studies at Princeton or whatever, it was <laughs> like, there's two kind of different classes. There's the Mandarin, what they call the Mandarin class, which is the educated class. Mm -hmm. And then there's more like the blue collar class of Asian immigrants. And on the East Coast, it was very much split like that. So I grew up in the Mandarin class, right? My parents were academics. Mm. Their friends were all doctors, lawyers, uh, economists, professors. Mm. And um, in that situation, a lot of their kids went to private school. And um, the goal was very much to pull instruments. I don't think I know one Asian kid who doesn't play piano or cello or violin, <laughs> one of the three, probably two of the three, you know? Both yeah. my brother and I played two of those three. <laughs> um, and probably we went to art class or some sort of thing like that. And it was very much about going to an Ivy League school, period. Mm -hmm. uh, there is video, like home video footage of me at like four years old saying, I'm going to go to Princeton uh, with a, uh, what's the word? I don't even, merit scholarship, right? It's based wow. on PSAT. Yeah. So, I mean, think about it. If you've been taking the SATs from third grade on, like I was like locked in, you know what I mean? So <laughs> Um, and that was very much like our sort of thing it was like about being educated about being, um, you know, successful in this very like go to the Ivy League school, be a doctor, be an engineer, be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, later on, especially after like in the 90s, then it was okay to be like an eye banker or in finance or something like that, right? Yeah. Or cons managing consultant. But um, and then coming out to the West Coast, what's been cool for me uh, here was meeting all these kids who um, they grew up around all Asians or Latinos. Okay, so mm. they didn't they didn't grow up with white people, and of course there were different racial dynamics that they had to deal with. But um, you know, it was like they had so much more diversity. Just and that was so cool to me. Like you mm. know, that wasn't my experience growing up. That's what I craved. That's why I ended up in New York. That's why I ended up in LA. That's why mm -hmm. I, you know I. I I was a lot of people, you know, they grow up in a town and they, they're going to stay in that town. A lot of my people I know from high school, they still live in Maryland, but me, there was never a question that I would stay there. Even yeah. though now Baltimore so I, I really love Baltimore and I think it, it's such an amazing place and, um, and it has it continued to evolve. But um, back then there was like no question in my, in my mind that I was not going to stay there. There's no way I was staying in Baltimore. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of cool to see, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. And the West coast is just different. Like there's more, uh, there's a lot more Asian people, you know, so mm -hmm. there's a lot yeah. of different, different, there's more different, um, varying like kind of groups within Asian culture, Asian American yeah. culture here. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I can't really think, I can't think of things off the top of my head, but it's like, it's so, I don't know, it's so clear to me, like when it happens, I don't yeah. know how to explain that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Also, like what I love about being in LA, so where I grew up was mainly Chinese, uh, Korean, and Indian. There was like no Japanese people, very few Japanese people, mm -hmm. and very few Filipino people. I only knew one Filipino person that was like my uh, piano professor who was like a prodigy <laughs> from the Philippines, Ronaldo <laughs> Reyes. He was awesome. But, um, you know, coming out to the West Coast, too, was great. Like, I mean, I'm like adopted Panay or whatever. Like, I have so <laughs> many Filipino friends. And uh, Keep was so embraced by Filipino Americans. And mm -hmm. also, like, uh, you know, I have so many, so many of the people who worked in me, with me and were a part of the Keep family where, 
were Filipino. So I have a lot of like love for the Philippines big time, but, but yeah, just like that kind of diversity. We didn't have that kind of like Asian diversity, really. We didn't really have a lot of Southeast Asians where I grew up. Um, Mm. And uh, yeah, it's just different. It's like a different mentality in a weird way. It's like, uh, also there's just more, I don't know. There's just more, street sensibility out here i feel like with asians um as opposed to like east coast asian east coast asians mm-hmm. like i feel like the goal was to assimilate and go to like an ivy league you know yeah. and west coast asians is not necessarily like that you have mm-hmm. your own world here mm-hmm. and like before you can get to just be and i think a lot of west coast asians take that for granted and um uh like i, lo- I love being out here and being able to be just comfortable and, and to be you know I mean, you have to understand, like, growing up here, like, of course you dealt with racism. Of course that was the issue or whatever. But, you know, even just going home, I can go into a gas station that's, like, a little bit, like, off the road. And immediately I feel that feeling of, Mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm my first. And I didn't even realize this till I got older. My, but my first thing is I'm, I scanning, I'm scanning everybody who's in, like, the gas station. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, are you an ally or are you not going to be my friend. Like Mm -hmm. I'm already tense like that. Yeah. Or, um, you know, growing up, you had to be super polite to white people because they automatically made you feel different and they expected you to be different. So you were constantly trying to prove like, well, if I go to a school where presidents go to, then I'm just as good as you. And I'm, I'm, I, I belong on the, on, on this. I, I I get a seat at the table, you know, Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it was constantly like little nego- and you didn't want to misbehave, right? Because if you're misbehaving, then they'll pin stuff on you. Like, I mean, I yeah. can tell you so many things uh, that I experienced growing up, but it was always about, um, you know, there was like a system and you had to play into the system. And I, and I could be wrong because I didn't, again, I didn't grow up on the West Coast, but I feel like maybe that wasn't as much of a issue, you mm. know? That's and valid. that takes, that takes a lot of subconscious energy when you're constantly negotiating um that sort of dynamic even when as a very little kid you're aware of it i mean i i Mm. i I feel like i never wasn't aware of it so um yeah so i don't know it's just different and i just think east coast is more like i mean it's just a difference between east coast and west coast to east coast old money Mm. um a lot of power a lot of old institutions west coast a little bit more freer a little bit uh, more like new money and uh I don't know it's just different it's different but i really love like la I'm, I'm so happy here and like i really have a lot of love for for southern california so absolutely I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable here you know in a way that yeah. that was harder for me in like a smaller town on the east coast yeah for sure well kind of going back to you know your roots and you talking about the influence of your of your brother and and you know stressing you know how important respect is and your your parents involving you in so many extracurricular activities mm-hmm. just talking about you know you you're you're kind of saying it nonchalantly but just getting into princeton and and what that experience was like and obviously you had a lot of things to prep you there but you did put in that work and you did get into there so what was it like going into an ivy league and 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 thriving there and you know essentially that was a standard and you met it uh You know, (laughs) it was really hard, obviously. And it was really, uh, you had to have strategy. You had to have a plan. You had to know exactly what went into it. You know, like a lot of my friends who grew up here, like their parents didn't even care if they went to college or didn't, you know, didn't have a opinion on which school they went to. My parents were incredibly involved from like day one. Like I never, I applied early to Princeton when you applied early at that age, I mean, and that during that time, it was, uh, you were committed to go if you got accepted. So I ended up not even having to apply to any other schools. Wow. Um, but, um, I, but of course I had already done all my college applications the summer before. So I already had like 10 applications ready to go. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the kind of mentality. That's how I was raised. You know what yeah. I mean? I have to stop licking me. <laughs> <Can't> <laughs> me. Um, but, uh, yeah, it just, took a lot of discipline, constant practice, constant, uh, everything um, was about following through to the goal. And, you know, on, on one hand, 
you know, I've read something that said something about how, uh, actually Juliana who used to work for me, she had, she had told mm -hmm. me about this where somebody had said something like discipline is a form of self love. And I really liked that framework because it's true. If you can be disciplined with yourself, that is, that is you ultimately deciding what you want and sticking to it and having consistency for yourself. Yeah. I think with everything, it's about how you frame it and how you talk to yourself and how you communicate with yourself in order to execute. Because I think the reason why, <laughs> my is going crazy. I think the reason why um, um, a lot of people have difficulty following through is because they haven't framed it properly in their head or they haven't mm. dialed in what is the best way to frame it in order to uh, work for themselves. Mm. Um, I mean, I can talk to you about Princeton getting into uh, Stanford and stuff. Yeah, it was really hard. And yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I took the SATs every year for from eight years old, years old onward. It takes a lot of practice and a lot of discipline. But um, it's funny, I did all that. And I proved that all to myself. But in, in, in the end, it was to show myself that I could do it, but I don't actually really care about it. Most of my friends maybe didn't even go to college or they went to art school, you know, mm. I don't, um, I don't, it was almost like I had to be at the top of this elite structure in order to prove to myself that I could be it. And that it mm. was a choice not to participate in it because I don't, I don't buy into that um, elitism. I don't buy into elitism period, but definitely like the sense that um, because you're smart, you're better. That's a very um, common and easy thing to fall into when you're, when you're really intelligent, you think that, and you, your mind, Mine's going so much. I think we're losing you a little bit, you know. Give me a sec. To you tend to think, oh, well, I deserve this, or um, other people just haven't done what is needed. And I don't like that mentality, period. Um, and I think, hey, <laughs> oh my God, she's <laughs> never bit me before. Get out of here. Oh, uh, she's Get excited. Get out of here. She's excited. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're out of here. <laughs> I'm being bad right now. Sorry, guys. Um, no I don't like that. I just don't like that elitist mentality. Period. I think everybody has value and everybody has something to offer. And um, it is our goal. What I what I'm more focused on is how do we take responsibility for our own life and determine what it is we truly want for ourselves, not based on what other people are telling you want. Mm. other people are telling you that you need to have and uh, how do you make the most of your life and your gifts and who you are in order to do it more important question and the more important framework and I don't regret how I grew up because it did provide me a way of pushing myself to discipline myself and to give me these tools but I also don't think that you you you're not any less if you started late you're not any mm. less if you didn't have this education first you can go back to school you can do you can do whatever you need to do i think a lot of times we have a tendency to think it's too late it's not mm. too late um, that i always myself um when i when I, I i would get very caught up in that sense of time right you're running out of time that's and that's what causes anxiety and i don't mm. i don't like anxiety i don't deal with that very well that's not for me um, but that's all based on this notion of perceived time. And what is time? Time doesn't even exist. Time is a construct, you know, how yeah. we, how we, we, of course, like time measuring units, but what time is in general, that's just a, that's a mental construct, you know? Yeah. So, uh, this whole notion of like, you have to be somebody or be at a certain point at a certain time that if you need that to motivate you, okay, but I think that's a very thin motivation and it's something that will constantly collapse. So talking about identifying the correct motivation, identifying mm -hmm. what you really want will help you motivate you in a more um, productive way. Anyway, the story that I always think of is I have this aunt who started painting when she was 70 years old, okay? <sighs> Didn't know how to paint at all. Started painting at 70. She makes these beautiful, amazing, um, collages with like and paint like painting and collages and a lot of them are sort of a traditional Korean um, scenes they're so beautiful 
anyway, she started uh, painting at 70 and at 80, she, her painting was selected as, and was turned into a postage stamp by the Korean, South Korean government for the Winter Olympics. She now has a career as a painter. That's at 70 years old. That's after she was oh a wife and raised uh, multiple children, successful children. And um, she'd never taken an art class before that. So I, I, I use that example to show you it's never too late to, to find something that you love to do. And mm. again, you know, the one thing I don't like about how I just told that story is that I had to say <laughs> to you, oh, uh, she, her painting got selected to be the stamp and she has a successful career, right? So therefore that justifies yeah. what she did. But really, if, if you just find something that you love, even if nothing comes out of it, uh, like from the outside, even if you're not getting external validation for it, like you will never go wrong pursuing something that you enjoy mm -hmm. period that is something that is valuable because this is about how you spend your time on earth and yeah you know how do you really want to spend your days you know how much of that are you going to let somebody else own somebody else that doesn't even exist it's a perceived perceived society yeah. I'm not saying you don't need to be pragmatic and I'm not saying that you don't need to be focused and that you don't need to have money in the bank. That's reality, you know, mm -hmm. but I also don't think that's all just a tool and that's all just like a structure. That's not like a way of life. You know, there's mm -hmm. an art to living life and that is what's most important. And you don't have to prove yourself to anybody except for yourself. And people say that all the time, but or just like, oh, you can't love anyone until you love yourself. Well, it is like truly the real journey underlying everything is, is within, you know, and that is about your relationship with you. And if, until you can uh, make peace with that, and until you really like engage with that and really dig in, like that's, you're going to constantly be frustrated, you know? Yeah. That's not for everyone. Some people are definitely more like, they don't care about that stuff, but I, yeah. I'm pretty sure like, I do think that it runs across the board that human humans have a soul that needs to be fed everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people are more easily fed than others, or <laughs> I don't know how else to put that, but yeah. um, you know, some people need more ever since I was a little kid. I mean, I'm talking little, little kid. I always had a sense of longing, desire, for something mm -hmm. other, something bigger, something more. And um, the one great um, skill that I was born with and I'm, I'm really like so grateful that I have is that even when I was a little kid, I always knew when I liked something. If mm -hmm. I heard a song and I felt it like right here, I knew. If yeah. I read a book and it would give me tingle, like really like move me, I knew, you know, when I, when I, go see something beautiful, sunset ocean, like I would feel that feeling. And yeah. that being connected to what moves you, because that's below the ego, that's like on a, some universal unconscious thing. But when you can identify what connects you to the, the broader universe, broader energy, that is what should be motivating you. That is what is behind all creativity. That is behind leading a meaningful life. To lead a meaningful life means to live a life where you are doing what you want. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is most people don't know how to identify what it is they want. That's why so many lottery winners commit suicide mm -hmm. or depressed or lose that money because we all think when we're in the survival mentality, and I'm not dissing because I have definitely with a business, I've had so many ups and downs. So I really have mm -hmm. been tested and I understand yeah. what it's like to survive. I understand what it's like to not have money. I understand what it's like to like, oh, I got to eat my canned soup today because I literally am not going to be able to like clear these checks if I, if I go out to eat. I get it, you know? Yeah. And I'm, I'm even on like the more privileged end, you know? I don't have children. I don't have, uh, you know, other mouths to feed or whatever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when I was going through that, so I'm not dissing or trying to make anyone feel bad for being in a survival mentality, but I'm also saying that there is a different way to live. And a lot of times when you're in that, you'd be surprised how little you need to survive. Mm -hmm. And so many of the other things that we think we need, we do not need. And um, whereas in so many other things that we truly need that feed our souls, 
we we don't even know how to identify you know mm. so when you're in a survival mentality my dad always talks about it as being in this problem solving mentality you're you're in a rocking chair you're moving back and forth you're putting out fires you're paying your bills you're getting into school you're doing whatever you need to do right but um you're not moving anywhere you're just mm. you're in motion so you feel like you're moving but you need to you know, when you're in a survival mentality, it's also a scarcity mentality, right? You think there's not enough for everybody. There's not an, if, if, if I don't take it now, I'm never going to get it again. Um, you know, that whole opportunity knocks only once type situation, early bird gets the worm. There's, and that kind of, um, uh, that's, that makes you hoard your life. That makes you hoard your talent. That makes you hoard your blessings because you think you're never going to get enough. Mm -hmm. or you're not going to have enough. And even when you have enough, you're like, I need more because something might happen later where I'm going to need this. Right. That's, yeah. that's that practical mentality. And there is a benefit to that, but you have to really balance that. And ultimately that's not going to give you a fulfilling, fulfilling life because you're constantly in fear and that's that anxiety inducing place. Right. Yeah. Cause you're always worried about the future and whether you have enough. Well, you know, I think, most of us have a much bigger safety net than we even understand. Mm. And we have to learn how to ask for help, but we also have to learn how to identify what it is that we really care about. And when you identify what you really care about, what really moves you, you will behave in a different, it, it affects you on a cellular level in the way that you make decisions, you know? Yeah. So I don't know if that's anything that I've learned over, over my experience. It's sort of like, you know, as somebody who's accomplished uh, things that externally are like commendable, like going to, going to Princeton, going to Stanford, mm -hmm. having my own business, being on the cover magazine, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it is. When you, I noticed in my life, every time I accomplished something, I didn't really care. I was just already onto the next thing. I'm like, mm -hmm. Oh, cool. I, I won this award. Okay. Well, cool. That went according to plan. What now I'm already, I'm already two steps ahead on, onto the next thing. Yeah. Well, that's not living. I never am living in the present, right? I'm, I'm never appreciating who I am and what I am mm -hmm. right now. And I'm also, um, it's important to be goal oriented and it's important to be disciplined and it's important to push yourself and want more for yourself. But you also have to have that be rooted in a sense of, man, I really love myself and it's okay if I haven't done, let's say you've tried a hundred times to like exercise right and mm -hmm. you never able or to, to stick to it that's okay just keep trying like you don't have to be perfect right now yeah you know you don't have to the more you start understanding that everything is a process and and every time you're trying something you learn something about yourself that is gonna be way more fulfilling to you like we need to learn how um i talked to this astrologer actually and he was talking to me about uh, what we call as the Saturn influence. And Saturn is a planet of uh, discipline, restriction, sort of it's everything that I was talking about before is very ambitious, mm -hmm. uh, go, 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 follow through um, type of uh, energy, like very strict, like let's do this type mentality, right? Yeah. And um, that characterized a lot of my early, my early life, my childhood, my early life. And, um, but now I've, I've entered into a different phase of my life that's much more receptive and more creative. And um, it's not to say that I don't need to deal with that, um, that that Saturn influence isn't always going to be a part of my life. But it's also like, he said to me, I was like, okay, well, you know, what's your advice? Like, what do you, what do you see from this reading? And he was just like, it's not that, you know, what, what Saturn is telling you that you need to work hard and do a lot of work in order to fulfill your purpose in this lifetime. That's, it's not that that's not true. It's that you, now, how can we do that with a greater sense of grace? And mm -hmm. I really liked how he put that. Because as somebody who was very, very assertive growing up, I really was kind of like, like, it's my way or the highway. And I also felt kind of like there's, it's black and white. Yeah. Which also made me be a lot less forgiving to other people and a lot more judgment because I'd be more like, well, I can do it, so you should be able to do it too. Like, you know, get your act together, focus, buckle down. And if you're going to blow it, that's on you. That was definitely like <laughs> how I, how I used to view life, you know, and yeah. view others. 
And as I got older, I really started to understand like, no, everybody is on their own path and their own timing. And I need to stay in my lane and focus on me. And the more I'm forgiven to myself, the more I can be forgiven to other people. And also that's based on this faulty notion that if you don't accomplish something, you're not valuable, but every single person is valuable. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of one of the things like with the American way, I love being American and I love America. And of course I'm very critical of um, lots of things about America, but I, I definitely am not cynical about it. I really, I love this country and I, I mean, I am an, I am the American dream. So, mm -hmm. you know, I love America, yeah. but something with America is we love underdogs. I was just thinking about this the other day. We love underdog. Yeah. Right. Like that's our jam is a dog story, but yeah. only if they win. Okay. Mm. If you win only if you're a winner and that right there is faulty. You know what I mean? Like if some, whatever, but it's like, you know, Vince, and he he never he never had any he never had any fame, fame at all in his life you know he never was that, was that never oh, you, you got any reckon bit. oh my bad um just like vincent van gogh like he mm -hmm. he produced all these masterpieces that are so influential and worth millions now but mm -hmm. during his lifetime he received no recognition yeah. and that just goes to show you when you do the work you should choose what work you want to do whether or not you get anything from it because mm -hmm. at the end of the day you will always feel a hollowness if the meaning of your life is based on what other people are giving you mm. other people's responses and how much other people value you i'm not saying that there's not um uh it's not important to be you want to have money you want to have respect you you know of course we we live we live in a we're part of a system right and our mm -hmm. interactions and our relationships with other people is important but in terms of like personal satisfaction and how you do your work, like you got to do it because you love it. And then you, if you, if you're working and doing what you love, you're going to, it's going to be okay. Like mm -hmm. whether you, that, that's how you get free. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a, that's a pure kind of freedom and there's a purity to living your life that way that cannot be replaced. Something I learned from keep and from, just being in this industry and just being living and alive and getting to my age or whatever, just not <laughs> that old, but you know, just being an adult. <laughs> I've seen so many people who work their ass off so hard, talented, and they're not successful or famous or whatever. And I've seen many, many people become successful who did not deserve it and who did not work nearly as hard. In my experience, it's 20% hard work and 80% luck and timing. 80% has nothing to do, it's totally out of your control, okay? But what does that mean? That means that however hard you work, however, whatever you choose to work on, you have to do that for you. Mm. You have to do that because that's what you choose to do and that's how you choose to live your life. Then when the timing and the opportunity comes to you, great, you'll be poised to make the most of it, but you don't need it. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't need it because the quality of your life is meaningful already to you. Yeah. And that's something I really learned. Um, even just with my own business, like certain projects are collaborative and were huge. And I never would have guessed that those were the ones that would be big. It's not <laughs> always the ones that you work the hardest on or, or the ones that you can expect or the ones that you think, um, you know what I mean? Like you, you've yeah. prepared for, you can, you can't control everything, but you can determine how you want to live your life. And so that's why I always say like, you gotta, you gotta love what you're doing and, and be practical about it, you mm -hmm. know? But I think you're based, I guess it's like, when I say practical, it's like, know what you need to live and, and at least be hitting those goals. But you don't need to be, you don't need to have like 10 cars and huge yeah, yeah, house. No. And this, that's all just extra, you know, For sure. it's all extra or like, you know, 
kids who are always kind of get clout on Insta or, or to be famous or whatever. And it's like, oh. with that visibility comes responsibility. You know, I would never mm-hmm. want that. I would never yeah. want, want that many eyes on me because I want to be free. So, mm. but it's like, what do you really, what do you really want from that? Um, they want to be seen and they want to have uh, influence, right? They're actually called like influencers, right? Yeah. They want to have influence. But for what? what? Influence what? You know, yeah. a lot of times then all of a sudden their decisions or their, or what they care about is more, is just another reflection of what they think other people want. So then all of a sudden it's not really about you, are you? You're just being a tool led by, yeah. you know, this sort of matrix of like public opinion. And that, that's a very difficult place to be, you know? I don't know. To me, it's yeah. always like, I'm always asking myself, what's important? What do I really care about? And, and that is something that can change every single day. And that's why it's a, it's mm. an exercise and a muscle that you have to work on every single day, keeping in touch with yourself. That's a daily practice. That's no. It, oh, you, you know, you know that's a daily practice. Sorry. That's no, that's not a, um, that's not like a, like something I did when I was a kid. I was like, okay, I'm going and I spent my whole uh, school years focused on going to Princeton. I didn't even visit Princeton. I just applied and mm. went because I'm like, oh, it's the best school in the country. Yeah. That's where my parents want me to go. It's the best school in the country. It was undeniable. I will go there. Well, yeah. I went and I hated it. It was like the worst four years of my life. I I wasn't suited for it. I should have gone to Columbia or at least Harvard, you know, and been somewhere <laughs> where there was like a city. I, I wasn't meant yeah. for a small, um, isolated and insular community. And, um, but it just goes to show you, it's like, if you're not, if you're not checking in with yourself and allowing yourself to change and giving yourself that, that license to change, then yeah, you got to do that work every day. That's the most important. That's true. Work, work and connecting with yourself and your relate yourself. That's true. I mean, because I'm far from perfect. Definitely. F- go ahead. Oh, no, no, I just, I just, on that point that you were saying, you're going to just be in tune with yourself and you saying that you, you know, there's moments and you, you hated it. And there's things that came with being um, at Princeton that, you know, you didn't necessarily enjoy, but also just kind of segueing two part question, just talking about pursuing and and, and going, um, you know, to, to Stanford after, and then you know, opening up and deciding that you're going to have your own business. And so just, you have this intense childhood and, and getting to this goal that, that, that's, that's so high and you do that easy check. Um, you put in the work and now, you know, you decide to go to Stanford and uh, you not decide, but you, you, you work your ass off and get there. And then you, you know, apply those skills and actually open up your own business. So just talking about like life after Princeton, going to Stanford and well, after I went to Princeton, I went to New York and I ended up, uh, first I worked for a, for a woman and a, a couple, Pumpkin and Charlie Gonza, who had a maternity clothing company called Pumpkin Maternity. Okay. And they were in the band called Governor that I loved. That was on Merge Records. It was kind of like this awesome, cool, small business. And I worked for them. I were there, um, budgeting uh, operations in check. And uh, um, business is so hard please like definitely like this is not what you should be doing okay <laughs> please like get a because um, then they, they went on and pumpkin ended up being a, a nurse and and chazzy's a speech pathologist so like they were like do this is hard because so i knew very 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 beginning that small business was challenging because mm-hmm. it is hard and a lot of people think they want to work for themselves and they want to have their own business but they don't, they don't know what it, they don't know what that means, you know? Yeah. Um, anyway, so I worked for them, but then I ended up going back to working for a trend forecaster named Faith Hopkins, and I did an internship for her during college. And okay. she is sort of like, uh, she's a, uh, um, I did marketing consulting for her. Or I did uh, trend forecasting for her. And basically I, um, at a very, she really supported me and loved me and really like uh, championed me. And because of her, I, I got, to be um, involved in a project, uh, a major marketing campaign for Tylenol that was like a multi-million dollar deal. And I got to pretty much do all the creative and, and really kind of creative direct a lot of the things that happened. And so um, 
you know, I was involved in a lot of like brand, brand consulting, marketing consulting, and, and it was, it was a, it was a campaign that was focused on, you know, youth marketing, which was sort of my specialty. Mm -hmm. And it kind of was the beginning of a lot of experiment, experiential marketing that is now like very commonplace, but at the time, like did not exist. Yeah. Out of money, and I hated it. I I totally hated it. I hated um I hated having to deal with corporate America. I hated that sixty percent <laughs> of my not not even eighty percent of the job was uh, convincing people at the corporation who had already hired us and had already committed to the budget that they had done the right thing. You know, mm. and um, I just didn't like a lot of the politics, and it just didn't seem very. Can you repeat that again, Yuna? Oh, you're cutting out right now. I think we're well, losing it. The perfect sort of core. Uh, Full background had been. Me? Kevin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, Kevin? You're, you're, you're coming back. Weird. Now. You're coming back. No, no worries, no worries. If you just want to repeat Sorry, that, that, that. No, no worries. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. My whole um, corporate, my whole, whole background, educational background, and all the internships that I'd done during, during college had kind of led me to be perfectly positioned to go into to corporate America mm -hmm. and to be like a CMO or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I already knew, like, I really didn't like it. You know, I didn't like, I grew, uh, I've skipped over a huge thing, which was probably the most inf biggest influence in my, one of the biggest influence in my life outside of my family, which was punk rock and indie rock and growing up in the nineties and, and being a part of very, very big part of, uh, or very involved in, with like DIY culture, like learning how to play music, learning to be, being really like kind of anti-corporate really, really like embracing and loving like um, independent industry was like, that's what made me found my power. That was what was empowering because it to it showed me, you know, you don't have to be this huge, you don't have to be signed by a major label and a major industry. Like you can do it. You want to be in a band, you just play, yeah. set up your own show, put out your own record. And that community and that culture, which was also very critical because it was very much about like uh, being straight edge. Well, some of it was straight edge, which I was for part of college or um, being involved in. Um... Oh, cutting out again. No. Oh my God. No worries, yes. no worries. Then, yeah, you're God, good. I don't know what's you going on. You're good. No, it's, it's all good. My wife was it's good before. It's okay. No worries. But uh, just, you know, that community was very much about, like, and doing it things for yourself, being aware about the bigger, um, the, the broader world and what your responsibility was. You know, it was political. It was, a, and I loved it because it was inclusive. It was anti-racist. It was uh, feminist. my oh. uh, so yeah. you know don't do this to me <laughs> oh you good can you so maybe, maybe no maybe maybe uh, just repeat that last that last bit because you had you you came back on and then you you kind of just cut off for like the last 10 Dude, seconds I'm so, I don't know what's going on it was fine no worries before. No, no, no um, worries. Longest rooms. Yeah, if, if you want to do that, you could totally do that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, here, let me let me try and move this a little bit. Maybe it'll be better. Yeah. Maybe that'll be more, a little bit more closer to the modem or whatever. Okay. Um, just I guess I was just talking about how uh you know, punk, punk rock, DC punk, and um, sort, of sort of the indie community in Baltimore and, and in that area, that was so formative to me and really mm -hmm. um, empowered me. And it was feminist, it was anti-racist, it was creative, and um, it was very much like anti-corporate. And that was awesome. Like that, that showed me 
that it was my responsibility to be politically active and it was my responsibility that showed me that my the way that i could be active was by in the daily decisions in my life where i chose to spend my money who i chose to spend it with what i chose to consume those are those are that's how you can be a political being an activist on a daily level without i think a lot of times we have this negative connotation towards activism which only recently has really started to change which i love yeah but you don't have to be maybe you're not like a showy person and you don't want to post on insta that's fine do your thing mm -hmm. but you can be um a responsible again about taking responsibility for your life and how you live your life and you can you can live your values and you can show activism every single day mm -hmm. how you treat others how you behave what you purchase what you eat all of those things are, can be a political act mm -hmm. um so it doesn't have to be this thing some you know i think we, a lot of people put it put it like activism is like a thing and a separate thing and it's not it can just be how you live you know mm. it should be how you live your values should be reflected in your actions in your life not for any reason except that is the meaning of existence and if you're not doing that you're robbing yourself of of living truthfully to yourself you know yeah um, but yeah, that was a huge influence to me. So when I was at uh, working on all these corporate accounts, I just, I really just didn't like corporate America. And I, so then 9-11 happened and I was like, mm. I don't want to be in New York anymore. So I went to business school. I ended up getting to business school. I actually um, delayed it a year. And, um, and ended up going, whatever, had a good time. Liked it better than Princeton, but mm. Pretty much from that point, I already knew um, I need to do my own thing. And so that's, so my sort of punk background, my DIY background um, is what led me towards entrepreneurship. And a lot of people are like, wow, you're so brave. Like, wow, that's so scary. But the thing for me is that's just how I'm made. It wasn't even really a choice. So um, yeah, it's scary, but you have to listen to your heart. If it's in you, then do it. If it's not in you, and you don't feel guilty about it you know what i mean if it's like you kind of you think it's cool but like you don't feel it right here don't do it you don't have to find something else find a different way yeah. to express yourself i Absolutely. think you know i noticed that when i when we we're just talking before we got on here kev you're like oh yeah i'm i'm doing this podcast i've been trying to do this for years and i, I finally like no excuses i'm gonna do it right and i totally get that i get it and i yeah. definitely like said something like that but i also say why do we even use that framework and that language? Why not? Um, wow, it's so great. I've been thinking about this for several years and, and, and been, you know, ruminating on it and developing it. And now I finally got a great opportunity to do it. See, so, yeah, as a very subtle change in language. Yeah. And, um, and that's what I'm talking about, like uh, uh, navigating discipline with grace. Like we don't have to be so hard on ourselves all the time you can still encourage yourself and be productive but uh with a different kind of language those little language cues they make a difference you know yeah that's why in my early life i feel like i was so hard and so tough because that's how i spoke to myself like i used to joke like my inner monologue voice is dmx's voice you know it's all, <laughs> like go 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 yeah. you know and like you know you want to like just no you can't like don't be weak don't be whatever like f-bombs everywhere you know and now i don't i don't i don't like relate to that as much anymore because mm -hmm. uh it, it takes away i mean yeah maybe like maybe you need that if you're really like just sometimes people need that you know mm -hmm. but at a certain point you have to start realizing oh i can change this like i can give myself a little bit of credit or this isn't working this isn't working you know yeah and uh you have to step back and then try different things until you really dial in what actually works. So anyway, so yeah, that's how I ended up starting, starting keep. I, I had worked on it, the idea while I was in business school and I just knew, I, I just knew I needed to do my own thing. There was an opportunity in sneakers. So that's why I did it, but it wasn't even about my love for sneakers. It was literally like my love for having my own business and living mm. my life my way. And it, the philosophy and the values of keep have, could have been applied to any product or any any kind of like industry it was yeah. more just like how do i want to live my life yeah well i mean if you can just talk a little bit about 
how you want to live your life and just just talking more so about the company talking about you know the uh keep being vegan made mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff and just talking about anything and everything and going through those ups and downs and just filling in the audience and whoever's tuning in and just you know about keep company how you created it how you've navigated through that well when we first started to keep it was an all-women sneaker company because i used to skate and i could never find sneakers that were cool like i wanted to wear eye paths and it was very i'm a size five and a half men so very hard to find those yeah. shoes <laughs> and then the other shoes like that were for girls like the dc skate shoes they were like pink and bubbly and like huge and i'm yeah. like I, can't, I don't fuck with this i can't wear this yeah. and I, so i started seeing this like opportunity you know for um for like there weren't women's, which is so funny. It's so popular now, but back mm-hmm. then it was, it was not easy. So I started as a women's company, all women's company, but then dudes within the first season, dudes were knocking down my door and women weren't really buying sneakers. So mm. immediately we became unisex. Got it. But, um, you know, in terms of the values, the reason why we we're vegan is even though you don't have to be vegan to work for my company. I'm not vegan. Um, but I, <laughs> but I probably eat vegan like 90% of the time, but it was mm. more like, I think everyone should live their life how they want to live and make their choices responsibly. And that's on you. That's, that's your, that's for you to determine. But as a business from an environmental perspective, I knew I'd be making hundreds of thousands of pairs of shoes, which I have in the mm-hmm. course of having keep hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pairs of shoes and the environmental impact of leather and of that industry um was like seemed irresponsible to me Mm -hmm. so i would rather from the very get uh have a company where i was you know producing in places that i knew were audited that had good work work uh, policies and um where we were responsible again it was about taking responsibility for having a business. I don't want to just poop stuff out into the world, pro- poop product out into the world for, yeah. for people to buy. It was like, no, I want to, from the very beginning, make sure I'm doing, making choices that I feel like will be um, aware of its impact and its footprint on the world. So yeah. that's kind of why Keep was, where Keep started. Um, and we became unisex because again, it's like, I always thought like kind of gender, especially in clothing, especially in clothing, that's all just a construct. It gets ridiculous. Why do we even have different men and women's shoe sizing? It's, I mean, I get it. There's narrow and men's feet tend to be a little bit wider and stuff, but you know, it's just kind of, it's a little ridiculous that like, uh, it's so, you know, like that it's split by gender. That's all just a construct. So I, you know, from the very beginning, that was sort of a political statement. And, and Mm -hmm. even in our, in our, um, in our office now, when we're filling orders or we're talking about sizes, we don't talk about it in men's sizes, everything, our baseline language is women's sizes. So if it's a guy who ordered, who's a 10 and a half, you know, we're like, oh yeah, did you pull the 12? Because that's Mm -hmm. 12 women's, you know? Um, and even on our labels, you'll see like it's the women sizing is listed first. Yep. So like little things like that, which are small, but are like, this is a reflection of my belief. So I like that, you know, and that's yeah. awesome. I get to choose, choose having your own business means you get to choose little things like that, mm-hmm. that seem, seem unimportant. And maybe they are unimportant in the grandest scheme of things, but that I like, you know, and it br- brings me joy. So. No, I love uh, that, that, that just to kind of inject a little bit, you talking about the conversation we had before we aired, just, I really appreciate that. Cause it's still something I'm kind of like, you know, kind of just coming to grips with like, Oh, I, I'm, I, I feel like I'm getting more and more confident and like vulnerable and being okay with like sharing that. And it's, yeah. Cause I've, I've been, you know, identified just as usually a creative in, in a different space and that most yes. dance. And so it's now it's like, kind of escaping that and like showing that I also have other interests that I love and this is allowing me to be more of me if if, if anything so I just really yeah. appreciate that you know I really I mean that's that. a big reason why I'm even doing this is because I was like oh it's cool I'm I'm psyched to see you expand I think you're an amazing dancer uh, but I also think it's great for you to continue to do other things you don't have to that's the other thing is like and you know this because you've been a dancer for your whole life and you mm-hmm. and it's taken a lot of time training mm-hmm energy, effort, discipline, that doesn't mean you just throw all that stuff away just because you start exploring other mm. avenues. And that doesn't mean that you have to be a dancer for forever, you know? Mm. Yeah. 
that's okay. Like you are a dancer for forever because you carry it with you. All those mm-hmm. things on a cellular level that you carry that with you, but you do not have to be scared to try different things. And again, I also detected a note of guilt. We, we tend to be, feel so guilty when we're, we have, we're not where we're supposed to be, or yeah. I, I should have done this, but I didn't. Do you know how much time, like so much energy is wasted on guilt? Like, yeah just stop you know like that's a senseless guilt like have you really done something wrong yeah i can feel guilty but like (laughs) you know in terms of like your life like why should you feel guilty about taking your time to go through your process you know uh that's fine you know and maybe you just didn't even have the opportunity to do it until now now great during this pandemic you have time to to focus on Mm -hmm. exploring doing this podcast it's awesome like let's let's start being a little bit more positive about it instead of um, kind of like constantly like shaming ourselves. Yeah. I think people do that all the time, every single day in very small ways. And that chips away at you. That's a constant needling towards ourselves. That is a waste of time. And not, mm. it's not an efficient use of our energy. And same as like jealousy, shame, guilt, all of those, not worth it. Just not, not efficient. So yeah. let it all go, you know? It's okay if you feel it, but then like, let it go, you know, Ugh, it shouldn't be that. something. Yeah. It shouldn't be a blanket that weighs you down. Cause a lot of times when people aren't able to, to do things, uh, that guilt and that, that weight ends up becoming its own monster, you know, and it's not even the original thing that stopped you from doing it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So don't, don't fall into that trap it's a waste of time you know like live your life how you want to live it and that means like not being so hard on yourself you know well i just one you know just to go on that i just really appreciate this is uh, for those of you that are tuning in and listening to this is there there, there were a lot of times that during my undergrad when i was at ucla and i would i would come and help you on on a saturday when mm-hmm. I, I didn't have class and I, and I and i always just found it more so just not just that, but being in good company and, and, and you always being really honest and having yeah. accumulated all this wisdom. And you were so willing to share with me. And I'm a very curious person. I was just so like, I need to pick her brain because she's doing something that like, that's attracting me because it's like, you, you know what I mean? Like you always had that energy. And I just, I really appreciate that because you're right. We, we do spend a lot of time, you know, guilting ourselves and to, you know, we don't need to exhaust energy that doesn't need to be spended on those things. So just, yeah, we just spent a lot of me. Of course, man. It's, it's, that's part of like uh, something that I had to teach myself. Cause when you're, when you grow up the way I grew up so hard and so disciplined, like the person who suffers, you know, the person who, if I was ever mean to you at some point, whoever's watching, I apologize <laughs> for that, but I guarantee I was a thousand times meaner to myself. Mm. And that's just not, uh, yeah, maybe it made me strong, but it's like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I really question um that modality now i don't i don't i don't think that that's a um the best way to motivate and i don't think it's sustainable let's put it that way and anger you know korean people we have this thing called what i call the crage korean crazy rage but it's literally (laughs) like a like a documented psychological phenomenon called han which is this generational suffering and anger and inability to process emotions especially among men um, that passes from generation to generation because as a people we have been invaded and uh, subjected to a lot of war, turmoil, starvation, whatever. We've been tested as people. And um, so for me, like I really tapped into that Han or that courage, like anger was my number one coping mechanism. And that's why I was so tough. Yeah. I could survive anything. Yeah. I could survive heartbreak. Yeah. I could survive ridicule. I could survive a challenge. I could survive losing. I could survive anything. Cause as long as I was angry and right, like, then I would be like, Shh. any, anytime anyone challenged me, Oh, you think I can't do this because I'm Asian or because I'm a girl. Mm. Fuck you. Watch me again, <laughs> anger. And, and, and I can't, I can't, I don't diss that because that really did get me through a lot. But again, that's that survival mentality, mm. that rage. And that is not a sustainable way to live your life. Yeah, And I'm so happy that I'm now older and more mature and it can evolve beyond that because uh, 
at the end of the day, that eats away at you, you know? Another thing that you said just about how you used to come to keep and, you know, uh, you liked coming because there was always a good crew of people. That is another really, I think, important to uh, uh, my joy with keep and with my life is identifying people who are good people, people who are in your tribe, people who you um, can connect with and keeping those good people around you um, and not having toxic energy, which by the way, people who are toxic are not necessarily always bad people. They're just wounded too, you know? Mm. So, but you need to find other people with wounds that are, because everybody has a wound, right? But Mm -hmm. who are willing to heal and are willing to, to focus on, you know, the things that are good for your energy. And that's the other if I had like one final bit of advice, it's having a business, being successful, getting to a school, accomplishing whatever you want to accomplish, whatever your definition is. At the end of the day, the most important thing is energy management. And I used to mm-hmm. joke that I would write this self-help book, like a business, small biz health, self-help book or self-help book called Stoke Management. You have to learn how to manage your energy and your stoke, because as long as you have energy, you will be able we are energy. That's all that we are. This mm-hmm. world, that's all, everything is, is energy interchange. My business is not a business of selling shoes. My business is interacting with people in my community, with people I have business relationships with. That is the yeah. best part of my day. And yeah. that is the best part of my business. The actual exchange of making a product and selling it is a, is of course, that's like a, like the function of keep, but that's not what keep is. And that's not what um, really truly feeds me and what continues me going. What continues me going is the momentum of shared energy. And if you don't know what you care about and you don't know what you like and you don't know what really moves you, you will run out of energy almost definitely. And maybe like for you, Kevin, you're a dancer and you had a lot of energy from dancing and that was, that was your hype. That was your vibe. And that's what stoked you up. And maybe at this point in your life, that's not feeding you energy, but you're Mm. getting something, you know, something else, you're drawn to something else that's giving you energy and talking to different people like this, you're feeding off of our energy. Well, then that's important. Then you go towards the energy is, you know, it's about Mm. managing where the energy is. Also when I'm saying like, don't waste your time being guilty or talking down to yourself or being hard on yourself because it's not an, an efficient use of your energy. Yeah. Oh, you can notice, oh, I feel guilty because I didn't do what I wanted to do. Step back. Do I really want to do this? Yeah, I still really want to do this. Can I do this? Yes, I can do it. Then decide and then you just do it. Yeah. Done. There's no like constant fucking leak of like, <laughs> you know, because that's not, that's just such a waste. You know what I mean? So yeah. if anything, I almost think like our whole purpose is to try and become as we get older and mature is to become more and more efficient with our own personal energy mm. and managing our energy is the most important thing. My dad always said this thing to me. I used to talk to him about love, right? And I'd say, and my dad's definition of love, I thought was so good. And it, and it provided such a clear framework to me in a way that like no romance novel or movie <laughs> or pop culture or relationship maybe could even teach me. He said to me, love is seeing somebody as they are right now not what they were yesterday, not who you think or hope they'll be tomorrow, but seeing who they are right now, accepting them and having the energy to accommodate them. Mm. Once I heard that, I was like, whoa, okay. Because that's a real practical, clear framework of how we interact with other people and how we can learn to love ourselves and other people. Because a lot of times when people are in relationships, they're thinking about ego and what they want, what they need and what they deserve from the other person. Mm -hmm. And that's not actually, uh, you're always going to constantly like end up hitting your head against the wall when you, when you look at it that way. Yeah. You know, I liked, I liked it way better thinking about it in those terms. How do do I have the energy to accommodate this person? Can I accept Mm -hmm. this person? And am I seeing them clearly right now? Because just as I said, every day, you have to have the practice of checking in with yourself and seeing who you are and what you want. When you love somebody, which also includes yourself, means every day you have to see where they're at right now. Yeah. 
and give them that room to change and to grow, whether you consider it to be for bad or for worse or for better or for worse, you know, yeah. but it's, it's seeing clearly things as they are. And then when you see that and you can accept that, then you can make your decisions accordingly and live your life in a meaningful way. So I love that. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, you can thank my dad. He's a G. Right? He, knows, he knows what's up. Absolutely. That, that Dr. Kim knows what's good. Dr. Kim knows what's good. Well, I mean, yeah. you know, you have literally, in my opinion, have always dropped knowledge bombs around, around me. And I just, you know, it's, this is just kind of like something that I have to do, even, even, even though that you've kind of already kind of answered it, but I did want to ask you just kind of, you know, a final culminating question, just with everything that you've, you've experienced and been through and all the adversities and, you know, growing up in very strict household, but your family, including your brother and your parents just wanted the best for you, going to Ivy League schools, graduating from business school, opening your own business. Um, what would you share or what would you tell a, like a 13 year old version of yourself or a 13 year old self or maybe someone younger out there who's who's listening and viewing this and just maybe navigating their own walk of life or just what would you tell them from everything that you've experienced okay i would i would say you have to exercise the muscle of finding small joys in your life every single day. Yeah. And every day you need to try and find, look around and see what brings you joy. It can be small. It could be something you ate. It could be a song you listen to. It could be opening your eyes and looking outside, seeing a bird in a tree, seeing the sunset, seeing the sunrise, whatever it is. I think when you're young, a lot of times you try, you're always skipping ahead to your future and you're, and so you're not living right now. You're always living in the later, later, later. And then when you're an adult, you realize like you don't lose that habit. And all of a sudden, like your whole life has passed you by. Learning how to see little joys every day, that takes effort. That takes work. That's, it is a muscle and you have to exercise that muscle. But if that muscle is strong within you, then you're going to be fine because you're going to be able, what, what that's doing is developing a connection, a neural connection in you and a skill that, sh that is to be able to identify what you care about. Mm -hmm. And it seems really like easy or stupid maybe when you're younger, but you, you'll be surprised how quickly your ability to do that is like, isn't there like goes away it atrophies and it and makes mm. you and it gets very weak and i'm not talking about when you hear a song i'm not saying liking it because it's in the top 10 or because spotify told you to or because mm. all your friends told you to i mean and, and definitely you can like learn to love things because like oh you didn't like that song when you, you went to a party you had like a crazy adventure with your friends and like <laughs> now that song you know like is that memory holder for that moment yeah. and then you like that song like i get that but i'm talking about Figure out what your real opinion is on everything, what you really care about, what you really like. And don't focus on the negative. Like a lot of times people are like, that song's whack. Okay, you know, cool, but somebody else likes that. So why don't you just chill and like let them like it, you know? Yeah. Instead, focus on the thing that you really love and mm. just keep finding those little things, those little nuggets of life, because that is like, that's like the, that'll show you the pathway to like the mother load. And when yeah. you are able to find that, like, when you can plug in and find to that source and find that joy at any time, no matter what you do and no matter what decision you make, you're going to be good with your life. And that is a tremendous peace of mind that will change how you, how you behave every single day, knowing that you have that carry that joy with you and you're able to find that connection with the universe of like whatever and whatever little vessels are that show you joy, the more you develop that, the more everything else will fall into place. That's, the, and you know, if you love something, like let's say you love like reading books and maybe your mom or your dad is like, Oh, you're just reading on this truck. Who cares? You don't got to listen to nobody. Yeah. You just dig deep and you love it. And don't, don't let any, I still love a lot of the things that I used to love. Even when I was a little kid, I still love them passionately. And don't think that you have to um, like that something's just like childish and you have to grow out of it. Like whatever brings you joy, brings you joy. And that is valid. 
and it could mm-hmm. change tomorrow and you should allow yourself for it to change tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But every day, just finding the act of figuring out what you love and what, what moves you, that is like the most important skill in your life and that will benefit you with everything. And that's, the, that's more important than studying hard or having a goal. You can figure all that shit out later. Like that will really help motivate you and be more disciplined in the first place. So that's, that would be my advice to 13 year old self. And also oh. don't forget that the world is so huge. Your life might seem small now, but you, now you, now it's different. You have access to the internet. Like I didn't have that when I was 12 mm-hmm. or 13, you know, that didn't come until I was, you know, in high school, later in high school. Mm-hmm. So if your life feels suffocating right now, find the joys no matter what, cause you can still find it. You still have access to it and don't, don't, don't give up because there's so, there's so much out there. Mm-hmm. If you have a bad day and you feel sad today, that's okay too tomorrow you can try and feel happy every day is a new opportunity every day is a new chance and there's there's so much out there that you can't even fathom so if you're feeling bored or you're feeling unmotivated or uninspired that's okay hey but just get hey keep hunting there's like lots of stuff out there for you you know uh there's like only like jewels glittering all everywhere (laughs) i like that the world is abundant you know don't give up i guess is what i would say I was pretty depressed when I was 13 and very emotional. So, (laughs) you know, just follow, follow that joy, you know, follow it. Well, Yuna, just first of all, thank you. This has been by far one of my, my, my favorites and just to reconnect with you and just, you know, you have so many more important other things you could be doing, but for you to just come on and to share your narrative and to just be completely honest. And it just feels like, I'm working at Keep again, like just helping yeah, out on a Saturday and, and it feels great. So just, you know, thank you again for coming out to the podcast and just sharing your knowledge with us. And um, hopefully we can follow up with you. And, uh, you know, when this pandemic is, you know, is all kind of quelled a bit, hopefully I can visit you in LA sometime. Right. Yeah, of course. Stay safe. Wear well, your mask people. Absolutely. I'm a, I'm going to link um, all the Keep company stuff in the description when the video comes out. So I'm okay, definitely going to get, definitely going to put more people onto it. And um, I need to, restock of some stuff so we'll kind of handle that once we get off air but yeah again you yeah. thank you so much we'll my catch pleasure you later. love you love you thank too you, thank you sure